my dad was the only person in my life that had a business and he was a dentist so it was a specialty kind of trade so it's different than you know as if he didn't have that professional thing and I kind of absorbed some ideas about business but he never explicitly told me about business he encouraged me to be there but like he never sat me down and taught me about business right he never told me about the finances he never told me about supplier management or or marketing and so I didn't I didn't get any training I empathize with your um, with the with the dentist in your family because it's you know your dad he, it's it's difficult when you are good at that thing and people value your skill in that thing and you want them to be successful and you want your clients to be successful and so you have to you have to establish your own boundaries and I would say that's one of the hardest things that I experience every single day. Adam Jittleson is the founder and managing partner of First Principles Catalyst, an agency and consultancy that helps ambitious startups to build their products so that they can scale fast. In this conversation with Adam, we talk about different parts of our founders' journeys from what made us want to be founders to if there was anyone in our life that motivated us or mentored us or challenged us to go down this path, some of the things we've learned from our journeys and how we feel about where we are and where we're looking towards the future. So I hope you enjoy this episode. It is the first one recorded in 2024, episode 180. We are getting so close to the 200 mark. Thank you very much for sticking with us. I know you're going to love this episode. Let's get to it. Uh, what made you want to become an entrepreneur? Well, that's a great question. You know, there's just something about knowing that you control your own destiny and knowing that your ideas are going to work or not work in the market and that you'll get real feedback on that. And it's not, you know, put through some sort of artificial filter that determines whether or not your concepts and ideas are going to have an impact is just super powerful. And so I love the idea of controlling my time at the end of the day and controlling the bets that I get to make in the market and in the world and get to be the decider of the impact that I'm going to have and get to shape that narrative. Um, so, you know, when you think about all those things, it just becomes very clear to me that the right way is to run your own business, try to build your own thing. And uh, that's kind of why I started uh, going into business for myself, at least at a high level. Is there someone that you looked up to when you were younger that maybe made it possible for you to dream for something like this? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I'm kind of one of these odd people that has a lot of people that I feel like I learn from, but not that many people that I look up to from the perspective of, oh, this person has done exactly the thing that I want to do. You know, I've had dozens of amazing mentors throughout my career. I still have dozens of amazing mentors that I lean on all the time who I'm deeply grateful for and respect. But, um, you know, there's, I, I think for me, it was more like I grew up in Silicon Valley and everybody's parents were doing something spectacular and crazy, but no one parent and no one experience stands out in my mind. In fact, it took me probably like 20 years to even realize that one of my best friends in elementary school's dad was like one of the first 10 or 12 people at Apple. And I just thought like, oh, they've got a really big house. That's cool. You know, but I didn't really, I, I, didn't, I didn't like look up to him per se. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people that kind of feels like, you know, you've got to choose your own version of the path and then you can learn from others about how to do incremental pieces of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't have, it, it actually took me about seven or eight months into the founding of First Principles before I even clearly was able to identify a couple of other people who were doing things that were pretty similar to what I'm doing. And now that I've done that, it's much more comfortable because I can say, okay, you know, here's someone who's, who's leading the charge, who's doing a good job of this. Um, but you know, we're, we're not trying to be carbon copies of each other either. And so to me, the, the idea of like looking up to someone, it's always like, oh, like it's a strange philosophy for me because it means that you think their life is sort of better than yours and you want to achieve the things that they've achieved. Whereas I look at it much more atomically. I'm like, okay, you know, this person has like a really cool newsletter. That's interesting. I might like to have that. Right. Um, what can I learn from that experience, but not necessarily the entire package. Um, so I wouldn't really call out a specific person's name for someone I looked up to like as a kid. Um, but there's certainly people that have have shaped how I think about different parts of the challenge uh, now. And I'd be happy to go into some of those if that's interesting to your audience. 
Yeah, I guess I was looking for something like, was your father or your grandfather or your uncle or your aunt or your mom, is there someone that you had direct access to that was actively running businesses that you had a chance to observe that kind of gave you this idea or this mindset or no? Yeah, that's the thing is is no, you know, and I, and I frankly, it's a handicap, right? You know, as I get older, I reflect more on what people have learned before they show up at the table. And, you know, you, especially as you start working with people who are just getting graduating college, you can really notice this difference because you can see who has certain instincts and who doesn't have certain instincts, even if they come from the same great school, for example. But I'll I'll give you like a a, a really short, but sort of funny story on this. Um, So in uh, high school, as a freshman, um, my favorite sport was baseball. And I tried out for the baseball team. And the previous year I had been an all-star on the baseball team. um, And so I thought like, no problem. Like I'll make the baseball team. Well, it turns out I got cut from the baseball team. Um, and, uh, this probably had more to do with the fact that like, I didn't really like the coach and he didn't really like me and we were probably, you know, not very nice to each other. And so like, like I literally didn't even get a single at bat and got cut from the team. Um, and this caused me to take up golf and nobody else in my entire family actively played golf at all. And eight months later, with no professional training and no access to a country club, I was a member of the varsity golf team of my high school. And so I think in a way, it's almost a personality trait for me that I don't actually expect somebody to have the playbook in a way where I can observe it first. So yeah, we don't really have uh, a bunch of entrepreneurs in the family, Um, uh, just kind of normal jobs, sales, IT, some lawyers, uh, an accountant or two, you know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary uh, from a from a business running perspective. So most of that I've learned, uh, you know, through being involved in startups. And in fact, my first job out of graduate school was working for the government, which is, you know, the least entrepreneurial thing that you can possibly do uh, as an initial job. And I think in part that taught me a lot about what I like to do during the day and what I don't like to do during the day. My dad was the only person in my life that had a business and he was a dentist, so it was a specialty kind of trade. So it's different than, you know, as if he didn't have that professional thing uh, behind him to do it, you know, like if he created a, an IT development firm or whatever. And I kind of absorbed some ideas about business, but he never explicitly told me about business. He encouraged me to be there, probably because I was cute and smart and funny, so the the patients liked me, and so it made them feel at ease. I would welcome people like I was like, you know, five, six, really young going in, uh, you know, in the afternoons with him when I could. But like, he never sat me down and taught me about business, right? He never told me about the finances. He never told me about supplier management or, or marketing. And so I didn't, I didn't get any training really, but I was able to observe the hardships he faced without him really talking about it because I could see, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I was there from six to figure 18 um, on and off. So yeah, I I feel like I learned from him that it's okay to not have your own job. It's okay to have a a business. But what I also learned was that you can't be the provider and the owner because that was his problem. Because he was trained to be a dentist, not to be a businessman. And he didn't have a partner to help him to grow the business. So he was stuck being a dentist and trying to manage the other parts of the business while at the same time spending the vast majority of his time in patients' mouths. And so I feel like that was a detriment for me in a way because I didn't get a chance to see those things. It was my brother that really was entrepreneurial but didn't have a a professional skill set in a way. Um, And so I saw him constantly trying to figure ways to make money, you know, at a time when you have eBay starting and PayPal starting up and um, Amazon was also quite early at that time. So he was more of a... Sorry. No, no, go ahead. You finish your thought. I was just going to say he was more of an encouragement to me to be an entrepreneur than my dad in a way. So I would say this makes me think about the fact that though I don't have sort of an archetype entrepreneur in my family who paved the path and showed me what to do, I learned an incredible amount from the experiences of each of the people in my family. For Mm. example, my uncle, um, who's a, a, a tax partner and has been a tax partner for a long time. Um, You know, when I was in college, I remember he sat me down and he said something to the effect of, you know, everybody else is going to study Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and they're going to drink on 
Saturday and Sunday, or, you know, basically Friday and Saturday, they're going to drink and party. And that's fine. You should do that too on one of those days. And one of those days, you should also set aside to do something big, to study harder than everybody else, to try to create a new opportunity, to find a new path. Um, and look, I was in college. I won't say that I took that advice perfectly, but that's been a hugely influential piece of guidance that I received because you can repackage it in a hundred different ways. And the hundred different ways, just the, the abstraction of it is whatever everybody else is doing, do that same amount plus like one more big increment. And if you always do that and you apply that to everything you do, you're going to build a better business. You're going to be a better dentist. You're going to be a better person growing the dental practice. If it's a dentist practice, whatever you're doing. Um, and, you know, uh, my mom and dad, like each have an incredible work ethic. And the thing that I learned, I think the most from them, if I tried to sum it up just from a business perspective, obviously learned a million other things from your parents, but uh, from a business perspective, they're just extremely dedicated. And, you know, when they work for someone, they, they give everything that they have to that entity. They're putting all of their thoughts into it. In a, and in a way that taught me to also dedicate myself, but it also taught me you know, after I'd had a couple of jobs in my career, how badly I didn't want to work for someone else. Because what I realized is like, I, I also developed that same work ethic. And so, you know, I'm the guy, I, I empathize with your, um, with, the, with the dentist in your family, because it's, you know, your dad, he, it's, it's difficult when you are good at that thing and people value your skill in that thing and you want them to be successful and you want your clients to be successful. And so you have to, you have to establish your own boundaries and I would say that's one of the hardest things that I experience every single day is saying, okay, I know I just did really good work for you, or I know someone on my team just did good work for you, and I still see problems here, and I'd still like to make this better, but I'm going to stop now. And I'm going to stop now because I need to do something to scale the business. I need to do something to grow. I need to do something to open up a new sales channel. I need to do something to recruit a new person or develop a new person. And just forcing yourself to make that really uncomfortable trade-off has been very difficult. And I would argue in a, in a roundabout way, I learned that from my parents because, you know, they each worked for, my dad worked for the same company for almost 40 years. Um, and it was a great ride. He joined at a very early phase. He got to do a lot of different things. Um, he loved his career. You know, he did, he's not like regretful or anything like that. But when I look at it, I say to myself, gosh, like what if he had, what if he had done that for 10 years and then spent 30 years doing something that was his own dream and making his own dream real. And I've got a, I've got a fantastic uh, coach. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I don't think he actually said this to me, but he got me to say it, which is, I think, the testament to a fantastic coach is uh, something to the effect of like, well, that's really cool that you're excited about all these other people's ideas. But like, why aren't you betting on yourself? Why do you think their chance of success is higher than your chance of success? Like, why is their chance of success with you helping them higher probability of a great outcome than you pursuing that same thing, but for the ends that you have in mind without any of the constraints or baggage? And by the way, I say this at the same time that I say that I absolutely love founders. I work with founders every single day. I love their passion. I love their dream. I love their energy. That's what motivates me and energizes me. But I also realize that I, I too need to be in the founder seat, even while I'm helping them, if that makes sense. I think your coach has a great question. I think for me, what I would have answered to him from my own experience would be, I've tried running my own businesses and I much more enjoy helping other businesses solve their problems. That's what makes me excited. And if you would say, well, why can't you do their business if you know how to solve their problem? To which I'd say, I don't want to have their problems. I don't want to have their teams. <laughs> I don't want to have their investors and their customers. I don't want to run their businesses. I just want to help them solve their problems so they can go and grow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, Be you know, the because funny I've thing tried... for me is, no, no, I, I get it. it. The funny thing for me is, um, like my entire career experience is in venture backed product startups and I'm personally building a consultancy. It's an agency. It's not a product startup. And so a lot of people from my background and my past will ask me like, you know, is this some sort of mistake? Like, didn't you intend to found a product company? And, and, you know, and, and really from, from that background, there's almost like a, like a condescension in the question. It's like, you're, you're aiming at this lower thing. 
right? And and you know, it's some to some extent, like if you want to be objective about the numbers, it's hard it's hard to build a multi billion dollar agency. Sure, it's not necessary, uh, but it's not great. But it's not necessary. It's not necessary. And I don't have any board of directors when I mess up. When I mess up, the market tells me, and then I know. And like that's enough. Like that's sufficient for me to learn the lesson, right? You know, I don't have to have somebody. You know, I think there's certain certain personality types need somebody to be pushing them every single day. But I honestly don't think that those individuals become successful entrepreneurs, anyways. So founders who go and take a bunch of venture capital in the beginning, it's amazing because it's a lot easier to grow quickly in the beginning with that. You can hire the right people. You can start off on a good foot. You don't have to bootstrap. There's a million reasons that that first phase is easier. But once you complete that first phase, you know now you have all these bosses. You don't even own a majority of your company. People are hounding you about, you know, it's like, hey, we grew by 5x this year. Well, it's not good enough. It needed to be 10x. You know, and like, I also value my family. I value a hobby or two, you know, like I value spending a little bit of time reading once in a while. Uh, you mean and you can't do all those you, things <laughs> living. You mean you, you wish for a European lifestyle? <laughs> I actually lived in the UK for a while and it was wildly eye opening because I was working for a US based startup and living in the UK. And like, literally, one part of my job was to try to indoctrinate the same level of urgency culture that we have in America for a startup in a variety of different countries in Europe and the Middle East and, uh, no. and, and really all around the world. And it was, that part of the job was exceedingly difficult, exceedingly difficult because, you know, people would say, well, yeah, there's more to life, right? And so you could get someone to work really, really hard from like nine to six, um, but, you know, come seven o'clock, it was a totally different ballgame. Yeah, I mean, I li I've lived in Europe for a year and a half now, and the vast majority of people I know are, you know, marketers or consultants or tech workers. And weekends, they don't talk about work. They don't think about work. They don't take calls. They don't think. In fact, Portugal made it illegal for companies to contact their employees when they're off work hours. So, I mean, I think it's one of those things where if you can set the whole culture that way then there's a semi-fair playing field for the other startups that are working in that environment. I think the difficult thing is we compete in a world market. And so, you know, if your business is centralized in a particular country with a particular culture, you can do that and it's great. I think when you try to blend that with America and then you have to compete, that's where it gets difficult for the venture back companies. And that's one of many reasons why I decided, decided to start an agency instead for exactly the reason you said, because I am a founder but I get to spend my entire day helping other founders make their visions a reality. And so it's super gratifying because I don't have to sit and come up with all the ideas. Um, I don't have to necessarily like have the background in these 45 different topics to be successful, uh, but I can help them on the abstractions that make the business actually work, which are, you know, for me, it's the product abstractions that I obsess over. And get excited about when i started this podcast three and a half years ago it's crazy to even think that i was in the middle of launching a b2b SaaS, and i wanted us to be venture backed we were competing well we thought we were going to compete with slack um we had big dreams those dreams fell apart and i've since realized that what made me happy was consulting and so i've started a consultancy again and this time, instead of focusing on the blockchain, which is what I was doing before the B2B SaaS, I'm now focused on e-commerce because I lived in China for a long time and I can speak Mandarin. And so I understand, you know, supply chain logistics and I did international trade for a few years. So I know shipping and manufacturing and, you know, fulfillments, different kinds of things. And the thing that's great about e-commerce brands is you can launch an e-commerce brand and within six months do a million dollars in sales. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. You can grow it to $10 million in sales within a year pretty easily if you can tweak a few things. Who's supplying? Who's fulfilling? Who's shipping? How fast can it get done? And is my, is my paid ads good enough and cheap enough that I can convert profitably? And I think e-commerce is so much easier than software because you, you don't have to code something for six months and then you know, see if people want to try it. Like you can literally take an idea 
spend a few hours building a Shopify website and then be drop shipping from a factory in China until you make enough money that you decide to customize things and develop your own brand and get your own warehouse. So for me, like I, I spent years thinking about software and SaaS and, and wanting so much to be a part of that scene and just realizing that e-commerce is so much easier to work with because the, the moving parts are so much fewer. Day. A lot of, uh, a lot of people who are in similar business areas to me will, will ask me, you know, how good of a business is it? And I'm very blunt with them. Like, this is not the easiest way to make lots and lots of money. It's not a bad way to do it, but on the grand scheme of things, selling people, selling things that have never existed before is extraordinarily difficult. Right. And that's what all of my clients are doing is trying to build something that's never existed before. And, you know, that's kind of, I always say I work in emerging tech. People are always like, what does emerging tech mean? And there's like 10 different words for it. Emerging tech, hard tech, frontier tech. You hear all these things. To me, the only real thing that is unified is it hasn't existed before. It's not just a, uh, a modification of the process. It's not just a slightly better mousetrap. Like it's something that's like brand new. And, uh, you know, that's, it's super hard and it doesn't always work and things blow up and you know you can have a client that uh hey just give me 10 seconds of your time i really appreciate you listening to the episode so far and i hope you're loving it and if you are i would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work and every week we bring you a new guest and a new story and what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much, and we'll take you back to the show now. Is off to a really good start, and then you know they can't close the next check, and the whole engagement ends uh, through no fault of your own. Is that frustrating? Yeah. Is it worth it to work on the coolest things and be a part of those things? I think so. You know, and so like at the at the end of the day, it comes down to what are your root motivations. And you know, I started my career in the government making peanuts, barely able to pay my own student loans, and I think it, you know that same uncle was actually the one who advised me to, to make that choice. You know, I had like a commercial opportunity and the government opportunity. And he was like, it will never be easier for you to have a low salary than at the beginning of your career. And he was super right about that. And I didn't challenge him, like it made sense. And that's what I did. Um, but you know, later on, like you have these needs, you wanna send your kids to this school, you have kids, you know, there's, there's someone else involved in your life if you're married, you have a partner. Um, and so there's just, uh, you have these other considerations. And so like, to me, the, the test is like, can it make enough that I have the lifestyle that I enjoy? And I think, you know, Tim Ferriss was like one of the first people who actually influenced my thinking on this. Back when he first wrote the four hour work week, I picked up a copy like very early before he was like, you know, extremely famous. And I remember there was like an exercise where he was kind of like, you know, write down what it is that you actually want. You know, and one of the examples I think was something like, you know, a Lamborghini sports car. And, and it was like, okay, write down how much that would actually cost every month. You know, and it's like, I think at the time it was like $2,500 a month to have a Lamborghini. And it's probably more than that now. I don't know. I don't have a Lamborghini. I'm not a car person. So like, that's not where I spend probably my money. Probably 20000 a month and, right now. <laughs> yeah, right. And it seemed like, you know, that's a lot. Like when you're working for the government, that does seem like a lot of money. But when you're a business person, $2,500 a month, like that's not a lot of money right? Like if that's a lot of money, your business is not going anywhere, right? And if, if you want that, you can have it, right? And so like to construct, I think the point that he was making was basically like to construct the lifestyle you want might only be one order of magnitude higher than what you currently make. It's not like a hundred X or a thousand X. And then if you achieve that, then you have to ask yourself, what's the next thing that matters? And for most people, the immediate next answer is more money, right? And, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, what's the marginal, I mean, like, think about the following, what's the marginal difference in terms of reward for your own life between flying first class and fly, flying on a private plane? The difference in cost is 10x, right? But like, what's the marginal difference? Maybe an hour, 
you know, <laughs> like in terms of when you actually arrive. <laughs> I don't, I, um, I think for people that are looking to fly private, it's not about the time they're saving so much as the privacy they have going, coming and going. Uh, that makes sense. And that's a totally like different separate case, entrances. Right? Yeah, if you're a celebrity. And I think you can, uh, you can avoid borders you can you, i think there's like private border crossings for private jet owners and yeah it's it's much more private and by the way i'm not saying it's not my job to say if you should value that or not if you value that fantastic figure out a way yeah. to create a business or a lifestyle that produces the income that's necessary to fly private if that's your thing right like we all have different things and that's the thing that makes it fantastic and beautiful and makes everything tick yeah i would be much happier with business class where I would then spend the difference on like good quality food and good experiences. Oh yeah, me too. In fact, I still fly economy or economy plus most of the time because when I look at the ticket and I think about what I can do with the money, most of the time I don't do it. When I upgrade is if I know for sure that I'm going to work the whole flight. And if I think I'm going to just watch movies or take a nap, I don't even bother. But if I'm going to, if I'm going to work the whole flight, then I'll get that extra space because then I feel comfortable. It's it's not hot, you know, you can get in and start doing your thing. Um, but yeah, like everybody, to me, I don't have like a policy. It's like, I, I do it when I think I need to do it. And I don't do it when I don't think I need to do it. Would you say you fly internationally often then? Cause I, I would only do it international. Yeah. So international is its own whole thing. Uh, you know, the, the honest truth is like the, the airline industry has been dramatically propped up, uh, by our government for far too long. In my opinion, I think it should be uh, heavily regulated, but more free market. And as a result, we have like nearly inhumane conditions in economy. Uh, you know, I make this joke every once in a while. And, it, and to be very clear to your audience, this is a joke. Like, I, I do not think there's a real comparison here. But there's a couple of things that are actually worse in economy class than they are in prison. And one of those things is you can't go to the bathroom when you want to go to the bathroom. One is actually the amount of personal space that you have. And I could go on and on. And like, I think that what has happened is unfortunately the airlines you know, took it so far in terms of trying to economize on price that uh, they created a situation where, you know, in for me, like I would rather not go unless I can afford a ticket that's going to have sufficient space that I at least feel like a human. Um, so fortunately, most of my, I do a lot of um, coaching and fractional engagements and it's hard to do those across too many time zones. So I don't travel outside the United States for business all that much anymore. It does come up once in a while, but it's usually like for a workshop or something. And if I'm going to do that, then yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy the other ticket. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I've only done business like maybe four times, uh, mostly because I try not to fly too far um, from wherever I'm living. Um, but like right now, living in Lisbon, I can fly direct to Miami and it's eight hours. So it's like... By the time I'm like leaving, it's like five, six o'clock at night here. So it's already like midnight in the States. So I just get economy plus and, and just sleep because I'll arrive early morning. But um, when you're going from, let's say, Miami to, I don't know, Singapore, it's like three flights in like 26 to 30 hours. And, you yeah, know, in that regard, thing. it kind of makes sense because like one flight could be 14 hours. You know, mm -hmm. so in those instances, it's worth it, especially when you're flying with uh, Japan Air or Singapore yeah. Airlines, or if you're going from Europe to Asia, where you're using maybe Etihad and you're stopping in Abu Dhabi, because those those three airlines are incredible service providers. So in those instances, it's worth it. I can so I John, I can derive a product lesson from anything. And to me, mm. the product lesson is the airlines are asking you to pay to avoid pain. They're not asking you to pay to appreciate comfort. And don't get me wrong, you can build a business on either model, but the businesses that I respect are the ones that ask you to pay to receive something that you truly want, not to avoid being punished, right? And so like, yeah, that's how it works. And, it's, I, and I don't respect the airlines as innovative uh businesses at all like it's it's just not a an industry that i look up to fair enough well that's one of the reasons why i started the company to compete with slack because their whole pricing model was hey we're gonna delete all of your chat history if you don't pay us five dollars per user per month 
And I was like, well, that's disgusting. I want to give it to everyone. I want to give unlimited chat history for free. And I'll charge you based on features that add value to your business, like, I don't know, automating stuff or integrating with other applications in a way that you can actually manage them inside of the application, like with a UI UX, not just, a, you know, this thing happened on the app. If you click here, we'll, we'll open that app in a browser for you. It's like, no, like you could actually, mm -hmm. you know, manage the application without leaving ours, right? Things that Slack would never even begin to imagine. Um, yeah, fortunately, you never like... got there. But no, I think it's I, that's actually I think one you just touched on what I think is one of the hardest product questions for SaaS businesses is like how do we determine the tiers, you know? And there's a hundred different answers to that question, but I think like the most important answer is that you have to deeply understand the psychology of the person in the moment in time that you're going to present them with this offer. And for you, when you read it, you felt like, hey, they're threatening to take this away, and that puts you in a state of loss aversion. And it makes you angry and you don't want to pay, right? Whereas other products are really good at making sure like, hey, I just got a whole bunch of value. Now I want to do this other thing that does feel above and beyond. It's going to add more value to me. Okay, I'm willing to pay now, you know? And I think that's important to really think about what that distinction is when you're offering different tiers of services. Like it should be something that makes the person feel good, not something that makes the person feel, again, like they avoided punishment in some way. Yeah, like Riverside's got a few tiers. We're using Riverside to record this. And what Riverside does is they're like, okay, at the lowest level, you can record for like, what is it, I think, five hours a month. So they're just assuming this person's going to be doing four recordings a month, something like that. And at this tier, you can record up to 1080p. All right, fine. Well, if you pay for the next tier, which is like twice the price, it's like $25 a month, you can get 20 hours of recording, which I sometimes hit, and we'll let you record up to 4K, which I have a 2K camera, which I got on purpose because my um, old camera was 1080p, and I wanted to try to improve the quality of the video. So for me, paying the extra $12 a month gives me higher quality video, so it's worth it for me because the camera was only $60, so might as well. And if I ever upgrade to a DSLR, which I may do this year, it's probably like $600 to $1,000 for that camera, but paying the 25 a month allows me to continue showing, actually getting up to 4K instead of being stuck at 2K. So in a way, their business model isn't so bad. Yeah, no, that's great because they're, they're clearly segmenting and saying there's people that care about this quality. There's a hundred people doing podcasts right now, aren't even using the video piece of it, could care less or couldn't care less, right? And so mm -hmm. like, that's fine. They belong in the first tier. You belong in the second tier. Everybody's happy. Everybody's getting value that they feel like they paid for. I think the other thing too, though, is people don't like to pay for value that they don't feel like the company that's providing it had to work for, right? So if it's like something that everybody assumes, I, I got to come up with a good example of this, but if it's something that everybody assumes is an obvious feature, like to, to be preposterous, it'd be like, you know, they try to charge you for deleting your account or something like that. You know, they have to support the ability to delete an account. Now they're charging you for this behavior. That makes people really angry. So the, the resolution one kind of makes me think, okay, that's a little rough. But I think what they're really saying is like, you know, on their side, they have higher processing costs for data because there's more data sure. flowing across the wire. They have more storage costs. So that makes sense, right? It's sensible. You can kind of understand the logic. And most people aren't like thinking of this actively, but I think it's in the back of their head subconsciously when they make these purchasing decisions. I think more people are not thinking about this, even if it's subconscious. I think some people just make a decision and then just they don't pay attention to the detail at all. Mm -hmm. They're just like, is this right or is this not? Do you think they even read the text? What do you think? Probably not. I don't know. I talk to a lot of people and I don't know, I, I guess the people I talk to tend to skew more intelligent. So maybe I'm wrong or maybe I just have a, a, a skewed mindset about it. But I also have studied psychology and I've observed humans diligently for 20 years now. And uh, well, I'm older than 20, but you know what I mean? And I just yeah. feel like the thing oh, is there's we only a lot pay of people I come like across one or two things better. at a time. Yeah, I, I love how I, I've had this conversation with women before, not too many, but of the women that I've had this conversation with, they find it funny that men can't multitask. 
<laughs> and then they get mad at us for not being able to multitask. And we're like, like it's, I feel it's quite off, uh, quite well known that we're like one, we have one track minds. And if you want us to be able to like, you know, stay alive and protect you, like we have to be able to focus on that thing that's immediately in front of us. That's going to potentially hurt us or hurt you. And so if you try to split our focus or expect us to be able to split our focus, we're going to possibly have problems. So I, I just think it's funny that uh, some women have expressed that to me that like we should be able Honestly, to multitask like, and I, that we can't stand at us for not being able to. I don't even like know. I don't even know what it means when people say multitask anymore, you know, like at, at a fundamental level, I think what people mean is in a given period of time, in a given unit of time, how many different things are you able to think about? And I think the answer is like any person can theoretically think about any number of things in some unit of time sequentially. But I don't know anybody who thinks about multiple things like exactly at the same time. And so I kind of feel like it's this weird esoteric debate, honestly. Um, but I definitely agree with everybody that says that if you want to accomplish something big, you have to have long periods of focus. Now, for me, as somebody who's, I don't know what the proper term is, maybe you know from your psychology background, but I'm a little bit more of an organic thinker in the sense that like while I'm thinking or while I'm focused on task one, like new thoughts will come to me about task two in the middle. And to me, that's different than multitasking because I'm not, you know, I'm like maybe writing an article over here. It doesn't mean I'm like also sending a client an invoice, but maybe I remember, oh shoot, I haven't sent it yet. And so to me, the important thing is to just you know, have a thoughtful system for being able to like write that down in a sticky note or in a notion document and just like come back to it in a couple hours or in a to-do list. And I think that's really what people are saying is like, are you good at making sure that that stuff doesn't get dropped on the cutting room floor just because you were busy focused on something else? Yeah. So I have ADHD and my brain tends to be extremely noisy and I found a way to be able to make sure that I don't forget anything. And I think it freaks some people out how efficient and, and how good my memory is. Um, but mostly it's just a to-do list. And I just keep it open in front of me all day. And if something pops up, I'll just write it down. So it's impossible to forget. And I'll include details. Um, and yeah. then yeah. I actually go through the list. And I hit those things as fast as I can so that they get done. And as a result, I just remember oh, this person said they were going to do this thing they didn't let me follow up with them on it. Hey, what's going on? Like there's this one guy who wants to introduce me to a list of his clients that potentially need um, credit card processing. And um, he promised me the list a few days ago. Didn't hear back from him. Hey, what's going on? You know, a few days later, you know, fair enough, early, early in, the, um, in the year, right? Oh, I got the flu. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I just wanted to remind you about that list. He's like, oh crap, I forgot. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. A few days goes by. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't get it done yet. Right. So you, like some people, you just have to kind of nudge. It's like, okay, you know, take your time. Like, Hey, look, I've got other people coming to me that need help. You know, I just want to be able to help your clients. If they need this help, you told me they need help. Um, but yeah, I feel like so many people I talk to, they promise things and then like forget to follow up where I'm the one that remembers everything that I've said to everyone and then follow up with all of it. And even the action items that they're supposed to do. And they're just amazed at how I'm able, and, and it's, this is spread across, you know, multiple people. Like I've got uh, a spreadsheet for referrers and a spreadsheet for clients and each spreadsheet has multiple tabs for people that are cold, people that are connected, people that are active, people that dropped off. And I follow up with all of them and I've got a status, you know, uh, thing. So it's like, I've made my own CRM as well on top of the top the to-do list. Um, and so I just keep on top of everything, but that doesn't mean my brain isn't noisy as hell in the process. I just, I'm able to kind of cut through the noise a bit and, and keep things moving. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I understand that. Yeah, you've got a, there's some great tools now too, though, that help. Like, I don't know if you use Superhuman, but I love it's got a feature where you can get reminded if there's no reply to an email and then you set the duration. So if someone says, hey, like, let's talk in a week, you can just, you know, hit command K, remind me and type in, you know, 10 days, you put a little buffer and then it reminds you and you're like, oh, cool. Cause like, I'm not quite like you on it. Like I'll remember a lot of them organically, but not all of them. And uh, like, you know, kudos to you actually entering them into a system. Cause then you can be methodical and then you don't miss opportunities. But uh, yeah, that's now that I think is a trait. I think to be able to have that level of organization, that's a thing that not everybody can do. And the thing is my brother taught me how to use Excel like 20 years ago. 
So he's he's the one that taught me how to get organized. Before that, I didn't know how. I mean, I had even in middle school, I had a to do list on a piece of paper. I folded up in my pocket and carried around with me. But even then, I think my brother taught me to do that. That's cool. But That's cool. Um, you know, I always joke. I but yeah, I spent a lot of my career. At, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I, spent I was going to say even the. Never mind. Go sorry, I it. spent a lot of my career at, at Palantir, the the data company. Um, and uh, people are always like, you know, what's the beta, best data tool on planet Earth? And even when I worked there, I used to give the same answer every time, which was Excel. It's the most prolific, widely deployed, helpful data tool that has ever been built in the history of humanity. Uh, and, you know, maybe I hope Palantir will, will you know, hold that number two spot. Uh, but when you have billions of users, it's a, it's a different bar. It's super helpful. You can use it for a million things. So what's the most important thing you've learned in your life so far? For me, it really comes down to you have to show that you care and you have to let the market teach you. And I think if you do those two things, like if you put pride and love and thought into the work that you're doing, and then you just see what happens when you do those things, you will learn faster and better than anyone else and you'll be appreciated. And so to me, that's kind of the most important lesson. Show you care and let the market teach you.